Hello everybody, and welcome back to another Infinite Lagrange tutorial video. Today, we are going to be doing a bit of a deep dive on accuracy, evasion, and indirect fire, with a special demo that I have set up to show you a few interesting quirks that you can use as a free-to-play player in order to combat some of the stronger or more experienced players. So, to start things off, we should probably describe what those stats mean, evasion and accuracy. Now, for the most part, for most players, those stats are hidden. You can't really see them um, in the game and know exactly what they are. All you can see are modifiers that you have that will adjust those stats. So for example, we are going to go ahead and go over to my IOB. The IO High Speed Ion Cannon Cruiser here has a very interesting uh, set of bonuses. Its strategy gives it a 20% evasion and a 40% hit rate every 30 seconds for 15 seconds. Now, my understanding of what this means is every 30 seconds, this will turn on and a countdown will start. So for the next 15 seconds, you will have an extra 20% chance to evade all weapons fire, whether it's missiles, guns, fighters, makes no difference, direct or indirect, doesn't matter. And then after that ends, you'll have 15 seconds where you are not evading, and then it'll turn back on again. Now, I have not counted this out, so it could also be uh, a hidden cooldown, meaning that the cooldown only starts when the effect ends, but most other abilities have a cooldown that actually will display saying X second cooldown. For example, we will just go ahead and go over here to the CAS. Eighty percent cooldown every 16, 60 seconds for fifteen seconds, ten second cooldown. So what this reads as is you get eighty percent uh, cooldown, firing duration and cooldown, every minute for fifteen seconds, and then once this ends, there's a ten second cooldown before this timer starts. That's how it reads. Whether that's exactly how it works or not, who knows? The game isn't very forthcoming. But back to the IO. Now the IO when you look at its propulsion systems, has a base 15% evasion, increased evasion. This means 15% of incoming fire with no other modifiers should be dodged. You can upgrade this in the engine stat by a further 16% for a total of 31. Pretty nice. Furthermore, by picking up the strat, and the new enhancements that have been added to the game, which I do not have yet. I could get it here, but it requires a bunch of points. Actually, you know what? We'll go ahead and get it. Why not? We'll pick it up, and we'll see if we can even upgrade any of them. Probably can get a couple points in it. So like this, and then we'll do this. And sure, we'll even pick up that one. All right, now, this gives us a 90% chance and an 80% chance. Okay, good enough, because I don't have enough to do any further. Now, you'll see that it is 40% hit rate, 20 plus 8 because of the new permanent upgrades. We'll come back to that later. So 28% evasion every 30 seconds for 15 seconds. This brings my evasion up from the 31% that I had from the propulsion mods up to almost 60% from while well, the strategy is active. We'll just go ahead and slap a few other things in here. There is a chance to avoid being hit by missiles and torpedoes. Now, I don't know for certain if chance to avoid being hit by X, Y, and Z acts like targeted evasion and that it will stack additively with evasion or if it is a separate stat. So for example, if let's say you have 20% chance to avoid torpedoes and you have 50% evasion, the enemy fires a torpedo at you. 
does it roll a uh, a d20 whatever to find out whether the torpedo gets past your evasion and then roll again for the torpedo evasion or does it simply add the 20 percent from the torpedo evasion onto the missile evasion and then check that against the accuracy of the torpedo i do not know the answer to that question and so i am not going to speculate now the iob for a long time was only ever used for its strategy which allows it to track small targets because of the increased accuracy on the engine and the double hit rate against frigate and destroyer on the gun plus the strategy in total if you pick up these and this while that strategy is active you will have a plus 75 percent hit rate to frigates and destroyers this means you will absolutely demolish them the same way that the cast artillery demolishes frigates however unlike the cast artillery you are both a energy damage weapon which doesn't matter so much versus the frigates but matters quite a bit versus destroyers and especially bigger ships and you are a priority weapon that prioritizes cruisers battle cruisers and carriers now this basically means that at the start of combat if the enemy has a front row consisting of a battle cruiser such as the spear of uranus or the st-59 and a frigate such as the special carillion you will actually start the, the round off with your unimproved accuracy firing at that battle cruiser using all of your damage on that battle cruiser however as you will see once the strategy activates you stop shooting the battle cruiser and all of your weapons will fire on that frigate or at the very least all of the weapons in the system which is just the cannon i do not believe that that affects the missiles but it shouldn't matter anyway because the missiles prioritize frigate and destroyer from the start we will see this in action momentarily now we are going to go ahead and pick up these upgrades just to make sure that we have as high of an accuracy as we can uh, i was going to pick up a damage here but really honestly i'm just going to pick up the cooldown i want this thing to fire as quickly as possible for this test all right so we've done that we're going to go ahead and pick up oh the just for the sake of showing it the command system has a neat little bonus similar to the constantine the great that lets you lock down an enemy fleet if your fleet is stronger than theirs in terms of cp the other two bonuses don't matter it's an okay flagship bonus but it really only is going to matter if your fleet is flanking um, and engages after another fleet has already started the fight then it should allow this bigger fleet to hold that fleet in position and force the fight whether or not it does well i hear mixed things i've personally experienced that it does but other people say it does not so your mileage may vary all right we'll go ahead and pick up the armor here which i do have maxed out another armor or rather health health matters a lot um some people think that health is worse than armor and energy resistance it is worse than armor versus physical damage but it is equal to energy shield no matter what if you attack somebody and that somebody has 10 percent energy resistance from their energy armor then you're doing effectively 10 percent less damage meaning they effectively have 10 percent increased life if instead you just have 10 percent increased life it's exactly the same however life is better because life works for both physical and energy weapons so keep that in mind when building your ships now due to knowing what i'm going to be facing i am only going to put the points like this and i'm going to put one point into the energy resistance i am not going to put the point into the evasion because there isn't going to be a need for it and then my last few points are actually going to go into the missile system on hit rate and on damage and the last one on cooldown i do have some extra points 
but I'm not going to bother putting them anywhere because they don't really matter. Now, as you can see, 20% energy evasion, 80 armor, 90,000 health, and a whopping 31% evasion plus 28% while the strategy is active. That, of course, goes up to 30%. Now, unfortunately, because I didn't think about it ahead of time, I do need to actually... Well, do I need to? I guess I kind of don't really. Yeah, I guess I kind of don't. So, I was going to retreat that fleet because these ships here um, in my fleet will not have the benefits, but I'm not going to. Instead, I'm just going to simply reinforce with some extras that I already have. These will have the weapon upgrades, and that'll be good enough. Now, to start things off, we are going to demonstrate evasion and anti-evasion. Now, a friend here has kindly offered a sacrificial fleet for me to shoot at, and we are going to do so with this fleet. And I'm going to discuss what is going on while this fleet gets, frankly, obliterated. So, as you can see here, our fleet consists of the high-speed ion cannons, the Taurus Type A pulse cannon, the Eris heavy cannon, and the Quar railgun, with some backup Zeno stingers. And if we watch this battle here, you will see these are special Carillion, stealth reliots, and then a pair of cruisers in back, just because. These cruisers are taking all the indirect anti- large aggro, which is effectively only from the Xeno Stingers at the moment. But you will see these special Carillions here are being shot at and are frankly getting obliterated. Now, they have activated their strategy, which does make them a lot harder to hit. But even with the strategy active, they are still getting just absolutely blasted. Now the strategy has ended. Yep, strategy has ended. It's emergency evading back to the mid row. But one thing that you will note, they're still dying. Why? Why are they still dying? That's because the missile weapon systems on the IO high speed ion cannon cruiser are indirect. They are not only indirect, they are indirect that also happen to target frigate and destroyer as their priority, meaning the first thing that they will shoot at. An indirect weapon system does not lose target lock when emergency evasion happens and they go to the mid row. This means that these Carillions, which are being shot at by these primary front row weapons, such as the core railgun and the Eris heavy cannon, as well as the main gun of the IO, those weapons all lose lock but the missiles from the IO keep on firing. So these super low HP Carillions that were being shot at, if they were also being shot at by missiles, will be finished off by those missiles in the mid row. Now, as you see here, the Predators have all died. So now the Zingo Stingers will actually hit the mid row here for what remains. Unfortunately, the Stealth Reliot does not have as good of evasion as the Special Carillion. So we will just go ahead and pick one here that hasn't been damaged we'll go with this one. And we will just simply watch its health. Once it starts taking damage, we will see how long it takes for it to die. And there we go. Here comes all the ion cannon shots, the heavy cannon rail guns. And it is basically dead. And now it is dead. And that's it. Now, this fleet has a high amount of damage per minute, as you will see here. 725,000 anti-ship damage. Of that damage, almost all of it is anti-small. So if your enemy fleet consists of a fleet of Xeno Stingers and DPM ships in the back row, and then their defenses are evasion tank ships, such as the Heavy Cannon Eris, like I was using here, or the Special Carillion, or the Stealth Reliot, 
these kind of ships will pummel their way right through them. So as we can see here, the fight in total took two and a half minutes, a little over two and a half minutes. And if we break it down by damage dealt, we see that the Taurus, which is a fantastic little destroyer, it's got a decent amount of evasion. I believe in total it's got around 30% evasion or something like that, or 16%. Um, dealt 88,000 damage over the course of those two and a half minutes. Very respectable. The Eris Heavy Cannon, which costs less command points than the Taurus does. In fact, it costs two less command points. So six versus eight. Um, or sorry, it costs one less, seven. Seven versus eight did only 55,000 damage. So what gives? That, that, that doesn't add up. How could these done more damage than these? The Aeris Heavy Cannons have a physical damage weapon, but what's more, the Aeris Heavy Cannon have an accuracy bonus, double accuracy bonus, in fact. Oop, wrong button again. I keep doing that. So if we look here at the Eris Heavy Cannon, we will see... Oh, I only took one. Well, we'll see that I messed up and that I only had the one hit rate for this test, and I actually thought I had both of them on, but that was my mistake. The Eris Heavy Cannon has double cooldown, double hit damage, double hit rate, but then it also has this strategy, which recently got buffed. The strategy used to imp uh, impart a minus 15% hit rate. And again, just like with evasion, I do not know if this is a percent more multiplier, so 0.85 multiplier, or if it is simply additive and reducing or effectively negating one of these mods. I don't know. If it's additive, it's no big deal. This 15% negates this 15%, and it so effectively only has one hit rate mod. And in exchange, it gains a massive cooldown. However, now they have buffed it. Now you can upgrade with temporary tech points or temporary tech files to reduce the penalty on that hit rate all the way down to 3%. And then the cooldown also gets buffed up by 5%. So you'd have 45% cooldown and only minus 3 on the hit rate. So whether it's additive or multiplicative, it doesn't really hurt things all that much. Effectively, it adds up to somewhere in the neighborhood of a minus, if it's multiplicative, a minus 1% out of these hit rates, which is nothing. On a weapon system that also prioritizes small targets. The Taurus, on the other hand. Taurus, I did not forget to take both double accuracy on because I, oops. The Taurus also has the ability to shoot or prioritize small targets. And its accuracy combined with the double accuracies that I took allowed it to deal more damage. You'll notice, however, that there was another ship that I used in there which doesn't see a whole lot of use these days. And that is the core type A, the railgun core. The reason why it doesn't see use is the same reason why the Eris's main gun wasn't that great against small targets. It has the cooldown bonus at the cost of hit rate. However, exactly like the Eris, it also has the upgrade now so that its hit rate penalty is made less. Taking double hit rate against frigates in conjunction with this strategy, it's not actually a strategy, this buff means that you will have a rapid fire, high base damage, prioritize large ship weapon. If the enemy has frigates and destroyers in its front row, these weapons will not prioritize them. Or, uh, sorry, if it has battle cruisers and cruisers in its front row, these weapons will not prioritize them. However, these ones will. And while these ones don't do a lot of DPM, only about 2,000 per minute, the core is a mid-row, sixth command point ship. So it's even cheaper still than both the Eris Heavy Cannon and the Taurus. 
They are physical damage, but with a whopping 500 damage per hit, these things can really punch any destroyer or cruiser and still do reasonable damage versus all but the thickest of battle cruisers. Now versus things like ST-59s with the armor enhancement, you will do very little damage. In fact, if they have the armor enhancement and they have the 600-700 armor on their ST-59, your air, air cores will only do 50 damage per shot. But that's what energy damage and torpedoes and stuff like that are for. Now, if we go back looking at the battle report here, we will see 88,000, 55,000, 58,000. Well, that's kind of strange. Even though the core has less or a priority that does not prioritize frigates, because this fleet did not have any cruisers or battle cruisers in the front row, our guns fired at it immediately. So once again, in the case where your opponent is using special Carillions as their only front line, or they're using Eris Heavy Cannons, Taurus A, which are both very ubiquitous ships, as their front lines, these core will chew through them like butter. In particular, I personally will be using Taurus A, Heavy Cannon Eris, and Core A in all of my mainline fleets going forward. They are just too effective uh, at dealing damage for the price. The Xeno Stinger, of course, did a whopper of damage, but most of that was to their large targets. And in case you were wondering, these Carillions and Reliots had full stealth upgrades. So if this was to be a... I should have actually included a Battlecruiser to show this, but should this have been a large ship trying to shoot these, then their damage would have been non-existent. And lastly, we come to the IOs. Now, again, only five of my seven IOs had the weapon strategy, which is unfortunate. But we see here that these also still dealt 25,000 to both the Special Carillion and the Stealth Reliot each for a total of 50-something thousand DPM. That means that these cruisers, which are designed to kill frigates and specifically upgraded to kill frigates, only did as much damage as a ship one-third of their price in command points or slightly less than or more than a third of their command points. Something to keep in mind if your opponents are doing a lot of evasion frigates. Now I think I've covered evasion versus accuracy well enough. The TLDR for those that want it and want to timestamp it is use your Taurus A Heavy Cannon A or Heavy Cannon Eris and Railgun cores in order to kill special reliots and stealth uh, or stealth reliots and special Carillions. They do wonders. But now we're gonna go look at something that's a little off the path. What if your opponent is not using any frigates in the front and mid, mid row? What if hypothetically? They're using the super strong Spear of Uranus combined with maybe some Solar Whales and Xeno Stingers, Constantine the Greats on a plus nine, you know, the typical whale fleet. Or let's just say it's someone who's using a tank fleet consisting of ST-59s and a buttload of repair ships. As we noted previously, those weapons on this fleet prioritize small ships with some exception, but if they don't have any small ships, then they have to try and chew through big ships. They don't do too good, especially not against an ST-59 with the armor mod. So how do we kill those? How do we deal with a fleet like this? Well, insert the quirky little ship, the Winged Hussar Integrated. That is the uh, that is the wrong one. Shouldn't I have the anti-ship in here? Wow, 
I am messing up today. Well, it'll still work for this test, but the winged hussar integrated and the winged hussar anti-ship, the type A and type B respectively, they both have a lot of anti-frigate and destroyer indirect fire. Now, the better ship here is the anti-ship, the type A, and I will cover why that is here in a second. We'll just go ahead and switch to a battle report so I can show you. Um, let's see here, where did we do it? Ah, right here. So in this engagement that I had uh, the other day, we had two ST-59s with all the upgrades to make them very, very dense and hard to kill, as you can see by the fact that they have all their armor. However, the mid row and back row of their fleet, or uh, the back row and mid row, the STs were in the mid row, these got obliterated. What well, gives? Well, the Aeros Heavy Cannons didn't do it. They can't shoot past the front row. And as you can see here by their damage dealt, they did 215,000 damage, which is a lot, but most of that was dealt to those Guardians. They did almost nothing at all to those ST-59s. The Guardians on my side, likewise, didn't do a heck of a lot, but they had missiles, so they did some indirect fire. But now we look at this. A winged hussar type A dealing a lot of damage, all of it to guardians and the nomas. Well, it turns out that the type A winged hussar has a nice little bonus. And that is this strategy right here. Focus Cannon Fire sinks all weapons with this weapon system and reduces their cooldown by 80% every 90 seconds for 8 seconds. Now, this reads a little weird. It says it sinks all cannons, and there's no cannon in the missile system. It's down here in its own system. But what does that mean? Well, if we look at the cannon, we see that the cannon prioritizes destroyers and frigates, but it is a direct fire projectile weapon. It will fire front row, then mid row, and then back row. And there is no way in the current upgrades that it has to bypass that or change that. Meaning that while this cannon hits fairly hard, 480 damage a shot, 3000 DPM, it has to focus its fire. But what about the missiles? Missiles are indirect. They don't care about row. They can fire at anything they want, and they prioritize frigates and destroyers. Well, what ends up happening in the case of that battle report that we just showed you is that these indirect missiles on the winged hussars attack these Noma in the back row once these guardians are dead. Now, in the current example, again, I messed up. I'm supposed to have the uh, standard, I was supposed to have the standard Hussars in this fleet. I did not because I messed up. These are integrated, which are only indirect fire. Um, the standard missiles will fire on the back row, the back row Nomas, and then every 90 seconds while these frigates are taking damage, the cannon, which is also prioritizing these battle cruisers, if it was set up like this, as it should be, that cannon will stop firing at the front row and will shoot for eight seconds at the back row with an 80% cooldown, 80% cooldown reduction. The weapon by default has a 15% cooldown and cooldown, if you remember from a previous video, is a flat multiplier. So if you have 100% cooldown reduction on a weapon, that weapon will have a one second rate of fire no matter what. Ships cannot go below one second rate of fire. Ships cannot get above 90% damage mitigation to any kind of damage. That is why you will see ships like the ST-59, they can get up to 700 armor but even a ship that only does 100 damage will continue to deal 10 damage 
to that 700 armor. Whether it be 10, 100 damage, 200 damage, or 300 damage, it will always do 10% of its base to that ship. Now in these back rows, these frigates, they don't get repaired. They can only self-repair. The reason for that is repair priority on repairing ships such as the Guardians and the Nomas prioritize from big to small. We will go ahead and just demonstrate that here on mine. Carrier, Auxiliary, Battlecruiser, Cruiser, and then after that it will pick between Destroyer and Frigate. I don't think it follows Destroyer and Frigate, it will just pick one. This means that if you have Xeno Stingers and they have a Carrier, your Xenos will fire at the Carrier. If they have a Noma and the Noma is being shot and the Carrier is being shot, the Noma will repair the Carrier every single time with predictable outcomes. Because of this, the Nomas themselves will often not get repaired. This is also true of Guardians, Tundras, and especially Ceres. The reason is the Tundra and the Guardian have nine command point cost. We'll see that right here. Oh, I have them built, don't I? The Guardian and the Tundra are both nine command points. The Guardian is also a mid-row ship. The Tundra is a back-row ship. Because they are nine command points and the series is eight command points, when assigning repairs and there are no other valid targets, such as the battlecruisers, the carriers, or the cruisers, they will repair based on missing health. And missing health will oftentimes be the highest on the higher CP ship. The Eris, for example, is a 7 CP ship. The Taurus is an 8 CP ship. They are both front row. They both have evasion, although the Eris has a lot more evasion. When an enemy fleet is fighting your front row, the Taurus are going to be shot first. That's because they have the higher CP cost. Some people believe it's also because, based on damage, there is some argument that could be lent to this, that priority can adjust based on ship that deals a lot of damage versus no damage. I personally have not seen that to be the case in several months of play, but your mileage may vary. Maybe there is some hidden stat in there that causes a threat to be determined based on damage. However, in this scenario where I have Taurus and Eris, the Taurus get shot first. The Eris get shot second. The repair from my repairing ships will prioritize repairing the Taurus because it will have taken the most damage. The Eris then will get repaired once all my Taurus are dead or retreated to the mid row. The same holds true of having Guardians and Tundras. This means that if your opponent has Guardians, Tundras, Ceres, whatever, in their mid and back row, and you have some indirect fire, that indirect fire can freely pound on these repair ships while the repair ships are busy repairing the front lines that are just soaking. Inevitably, this will lead to these, front, or these back line repair ships dying, leaving the front line ships unsupported, and then they will die. My suggestion, then, is that you use a fleet composition that does not take advantage of repair ships when going against somebody who is using repair ships unless it is a defensive battle. Now, as we see here in this battle, which has been going on for quite some time, my IO high speed is still alive, despite being the primary focus of these two upgraded ST-59s and the somewhat focus of some of the Guardian damage, such as it is. It then retreats back to the mid-row, doesn't matter because there are no other front rows, and the remaining repair ships that I have, which is only this one Noma, are trying to keep it alive. I had intended to show me killing his repair ships, however this works just as well in reverse. Even though my IO has maintained uh, the front row for the majority all but I would say the last few seconds of this battle 
Inevitably, it will fall once all the repair ships fall. These ST-59s, on the other hand, are still both full health and are not going anywhere. We'll just go ahead and watch the last two SAR here die. And there we go. The fleet died. Now we can go ahead and attack it with direct fire from these. The fight took 10 minutes. I only managed to kill a single Noma in the back row and damage these Guardians. Meanwhile, I ended up losing all of these, although it is quite hilarious to have the IOB here take so much damage. Damage received, 200,000. Now, in the situation that you will find yourself in in a lot of combat, you will find that the enemy fleet is going to have a lot of DPM. Your fleet also will probably have a lot of DPM. The repair ships here can keep up a tank such as these ST-59s for quite some time. But the problem is, it's an attrition game. If you are spending 9 command points on a repair ship that repairs 6,000 life per minute, and I am fielding let's find one here, eight command points on a ship that deals 18,000 damage per minute. Well, I am going to kill your ship before your ship's repairs can save it. It will go down. As we are seeing here, this ST-59 is being focused on and withered down And even though it is getting repaired, because it is front row, it cannot retreat. It cannot go to the mid row and be saved by the Guardians and the Nomas. And even if it could, all this withering fire will eventually power through. Now we will just go ahead and watch as this one gets obliterated as well, very, very quickly. Now, beautiful vid visuals for you while we uh, discuss what's going on. In future, when building fleets, I feel that a lot of players are going to be looking at the accuracy improvements that fleets got in the latest balance paths, where all ships that were direct fire, indirect fire, anything except for UAVs, lost a 30% flat alpha strike upgrade to each weapon. Some ships recovered part of that alpha strike, either with the new flat permanent 5% upgrade, making the reduction really only about a 25% loss on most ships. Other ships gained strategy upgrades, such as the Tor or the Core A and the Eris Heavy Cannon, gaining an upgrade that allowed them to be more accurate, which, in my opinion, is more beneficial than a flat damage upgrade ever was. Other ships, such as the Core Torpedo, or the Taurus, as a good example, just lost damage. And that loss of damage impacted their power. With the meta still being somewhat based around swarm and heavier swarm fleets, being able to plow through your opponent's front row of Spear of Uranus, of Heavy Cannon Chimera, or of Taurus and Eris can make all the difference for getting onto those back row targets and killing them. However, if that is not an option, or if you are using these indirect behemoths in a flanking fleet, you might want to consider putting in your primary fleet 
ships that have indirect weapons that force your direct fire weapons to sync up with them such as the Type A anti-ship Winged Hussar. At six command points, it's not a very expensive thing to put into a fleet, but if you have a couple of them, let's just say five, that is enough damage that you will be able to blow apart frigates, destroyers, maybe they are using Ceres tacticals to increase the hit rate on their Callistos, Maybe they're using Nomas to try and keep the Spear of Uranus alive with its self-repair. Who knows? But whatever the case may be, having the indirect fire can take a loss like this and turn it into a victory like this. That's all I have for you today. I hope you found this video instructional. If you did, please leave a like and a comment. If you have issues or questions, go ahead and ask them in the comments below. I do respond to questions as often as I get them when I can. Keep in mind, these things all change with the upcoming balance change to force auxiliaries and surgical strikes. These strategies may wind up not even being relevant anymore. And if they do, I will put a follow-up video out. But for now, that is all I have for you. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you guys in the next one.